the Town of Cary's Government Access Channel. Call to order our November 18th meeting of the Cary Planning and Zoning Board. Uh, we'll start as we always do with the motion to adopt the agenda. If I could please get a motion. So moved. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries unanimous. Our next motion will be the approval of the regular meeting minutes for October 28th. If I could please get a motion. Make a motion we approve. Second. 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 Oh. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously as well. Uh, we'll enter our cases for this evening. Our first case is going to be 19 REZ 11, the Cary Town Center PDP, and Ms. Dry. Good evening, Chair and the Planning and Zoning Board. We are presenting to you tonight the rezoning for the Cary Town Center Mall. Uh, this is a case that we discussed last week at the Planning and Zoning Board work session on November 12th, and tonight we'll be covering much of that information that was covered in the work session. Tonight's presentation will conclude with staff's preliminary analysis on the project's consistency with the Imagine Carry Community Plan. This project is for the entire mall site, 87 acres, which is currently built with 1.1 million square feet of commercial building space and almost 5,000 parking spaces, all surface parking. The rezoning will redevelop the underperforming mall site into a mixed use development. Key commitments include redeveloping an aging mall with surface parking into a series of development blocks, introducing new land uses and a st street grid network. The development program will allow for up to 1.2 million square feet of office, 360,000 square feet of commercial, 450 hotel rooms, and 1,800 residential units. This is on uh, buildings that could be up to 12 floors in height. 70% of the parking will be in parking decks throughout the site, and there will be at least two acres of community gathering space. The redevelopment request is to rezone the mall from general commercial, conditional use, and mixed use district to the mixed use district. This zoning requires a preliminary development plan. It allows for the applicant to set their own dimensional standards and propose alternative development standards from the LDA requirements. These standards are all listed in the preliminary development plan, which is shown here. This plan creates 18 development blocks. And although a mix of uses are allowed in most blocks, blocks one through four will be predominantly office and institutional. Blocks five through six will be commercial. Blocks seven through 14 will allow for office or residential. And as we transition towards the eastern portion of the site, the predominant land use will become residential. The applicant has identified the urban core of the project, which will be centrally located to the site as blocks 5, 6, 9, 10, and 11. Building heights are between 3 to 12 floors on the western half, with the exception of the commercial blocks in the center, which may hold some one-story buildings to facilitate a human-scale shopping and dining experience. The heights will transition down to 3 to 6 floors towards the eastern half of the site. 
The development program has both minimum and maximum land use allotments, which would enable up to 1.2 million square feet of office, 360,000 square feet of commercial, 450 hotel rooms, and 1,800 residential units. Residential would consist of multifamily and townhouses, and the applicants have proposed a maximum of 175 townhouse units. There are three types of streets proposed within the new street grid. The blue corridor will facilitate vehicles and bicycles. Uh, this is identified as corridor A, and it has a separated bicycle path. The purple route focuses on pedestrian travel, and it follows the urban core of the site. It has wider sidewalks at 12 feet each on each side of the street. And the orange corridor is designed to serve the residential portion. It's intended for slower traffic. Bicycle accommodations will be throughout the site. As mentioned previously, corridor A contains separated bicycle routes. Street side trails are also shown here. They're, locate, or they're, um, in, they're in the red color, and they will be along Maynard, Carytown Boulevard, and Walnut Street. There will also be street side trails along the eastern property line, which will connect to greenways to the north and to the south. There are opportunities for consideration for transit service as well within the site. The town has identified the north-south route of Corridor A to be a potential route for local go-carry transit operations. And the applicant has committed to working with the town at the time of development plan to accommodate transit stops. Additionally, Carytown Boulevard is one of three study routes for future bus rapid transit service between downtown Raleigh and downtown Cary. As previously stated, the existing mall site, which was built in the 1970s and expanded in the early 90s, has almost 5,000 surface parking spaces. The current site also predates the town's stormwater regulations. The proposed redevelopment will commit to the following. 70% of the parking will be within parking decks located throughout the site. There will be a reduction in impervious surface and use of low impact development techniques to treat stormwater. And there will be planting of 1,100 new canopy trees along the internal and perimeter streets as well as within the community gathering areas. The traffic study identified several improvements at the study intersections as well as, site, um, as, well as a result of the site generated traffic. The applicant is not offered to complete critical improvements at the intersection of Southeast Maynard Road and Carytown Boulevard as well as um, Southeast Maynard Road and Walnut Street. <coughs> These improvements will be essential to handle the site's traffic at project build out and ultimately if they're not offered by the applicant the town would be responsible for the improvements. That's these improvements shown here in the red circles. We also looked at the improvements between the site and Fenton, which is located to the north. This slide shows uh, the um, traffic improvements that are committed to by the Fenton improvement that's shown in the green colored diamonds. And here are the uh, improvements committed to by the Cary Town Center project shown in the purple colored diamonds. And as noted previously, the two locations with the red asterisk are the two intersections um, with additional improvements that have not been committed to by either site. Since the public hearing and the work sessions in August, the applicant and staff have explored options for pedestrian connections from Cary High School to the site. And rather than crossing at the intersection of Maynard and Walnut Street, Staff recommended looking into the use of a pedestrian hybrid beacon on Southeast Maynard Road to allow for a more direct and safer travel option. The applicants have not committed to this improvement, but they've indicated they are considering this option. Just to add a little bit of context to this, the town is, um, the town is looking to install a pedestrian hybrid beacon across Walnut Street from Cary High School to the shopping center to the north. And then the route that you see that traverses through the shopping center um, is, a, uh, is sidewalks that are already built within the site. So um, the pedestrian hybrid beacon that the applicant would be looking at would be just from the site where the Harris Teeter is across Maynard to their site. Design, architecture, and signage will be governed by the design guidebook. This is submitted as a zoning condition. 
The guidebook gives us an idea of the look and the feel of the proposed development, and it proposes an alternative development standard to the Town of Cary's Community Appearance Manual and the town sign requirements. These pictures are just a few examples from the guidebook. And we also have a few actual pages from the guidebook here. You can see the architectural character, as well as internal streetscape overview. The plan proposes 20-foot streetscapes along Cary Town and Maynard, as well as a 30-foot streetscape along Walnut Street. There is an existing berm and buffer adjacent to Ivy Meadows. This will be retained. This is a picture of the current uh, berm and buffer that's located there. The applicants have committed to a type A planting standard, so that means at the time of development plan review, there would be an evaluation of that berm, and um, if there's any additional plantings or new plantings that needed to be added, that could, that could very well be the case. So now we've gone through the proposal for the Cary Town Center. We are next going to go through some of the alternative standards that have been proposed. As we mentioned last week at the work session, the object of the MXD zoning district is to enable the development of land to have compatible mix of land uses in a highly integrated manner. And the benefits of this development are more efficient land use patterns, reducing automobile trips. And the LDO recognizes the need for flexibility so it allows applicants to propose alternative standards. So the alternative standards to the LDO that the applicants are proposing with this case, again, are a custom streetscape along Walnut Street. There would be a 30-foot streetscape, which includes a 20-foot planting zone and a 10-foot streetside trail. They're also proposing for their internal streetscapes, for them to be uh, designed so that they are a walk creating a walkable environment. They're also proposing tree planting areas, and where this varies from our typical streetscape is you would see um, a contiguous row of landscaping where the trees are. Um, here in this particular example, you can see that there are other elements in that as well uh, to accommodate um, street furniture, such as benches, um, trash receptacles, bike racks, things along those lines. The applicants are also proposing um, that pro uh, plans with 100 or more residential units or 100,000 square feet or more of non-residential area to be approved administratively um, for up to 10 years, and they're proposing January 1st of 2030. Where this varies from the town of Cary standards is the town allows for um, rezonings which have been approved that are proposing 100 or more residential units or 100,000 square feet or more of non-residential area. They allow them a two-year window to, um, to go through plan approval. Because of the large nature of the site, uh, because it's 87 acres, applicants are requesting to expand that to a 10-year window because of the, the size of the site. The applicants are also requesting a relief from the cross access requirements. So the town of Cary's ordinance requires when you're adjacent to sites that have the potential to develop or are developed that you uh, provide cross access to those. And they're proposing um, relief from the cross access as it relates to their site and the gas station parcel. They're also proposing to allow up to three drive-throughs, which would be approved administratively by the planning director. They propose that drive-throughs that would be associated with a restaurant use would be prohibited. They're also uh, proposing up to a 30% parking reduction. The Town of Cary's Land Development Ordinance allows a 15% parking reduction, so they're proposing to increase that up to 30%. This site has six champion trees um, that are currently located on the site. The applicant's proposing to remove three of those champion trees. Um, those are the three trees that are along Maynard and Carytown Boulevard. The three trees that are along Ivy Meadows within the, within the berm and buffer would remain. And as stated before, the applicants have proposed custom cross sections and streetscapes for uh, their perimeter roads as well as the internal streets that they are proposing. Signs will follow the, desi the design guidebook, which has been proposed with this rezoning. The design guidebook will essentially act as a master sign plan, and it will also allow for additional flexibility within the urban core of the site. And again, the urban core is the area in pink, which is centrally located to the site, 
not necessarily as visible from some of the perimeter roads, so they're asking for some of that increased flexibility in that area. So this concludes the overview of the rezoning request and the alternative standards that are proposed. Next, staff's going to give our preliminary review of the Imagine Carry Community Plan and its uh, applicability for the site. So the site is within a destination center and it's within the Eastern Carry Gateway Special Planning Area. This is identified as an entrance area um, from Raleigh and other cities to the east entering Cary. The plan envisions Eastern Cary Gateway as a high density destination center that will foster business through high quality design and connected mix of uses. Our preliminary review finds that the project furthers three of the overall policies which apply to the entire Eastern Cary Gateway. This includes fostering mixed use developments, improving the visual experience of the Eastern Cary Gateway, in this case it's along Carytown Boulevard, and focusing on connectivity within and between developments. Within the Eastern Cary Gateway, the Cary Town Center site is identified as a mixed use commercial base area. The plan gives specific guidance for this site, and we note that several policies apply to what's proposed. The plan states that the mall is ripe for redevelopment, that the use should uh, uh, use compact and vibrant forms, that the large parking lots provide redevelopment opportunities to create small blocks, mixed uses, and public spaces, and that it should be context sensitive as it transitions to the adjacent residential neighborhoods, and that development should have a range of mixed uses. We've also looked at um, the impact of Cary Town Center and Fenton together and how they're working together to um, bring forth the vision of the Eastern Cary Gateway uh, Special Planning Area. And we note that between these two projects, when looking at the maximum uses that could, um, that could be allowed, we could have up to 935,000 square feet of commercial uses, 2.4 million square feet of office and institutional, 2,750 residential units, and 900 hotel rooms. So this concludes staff's preliminary review of the case with the Imagine Carry Community Plan. Um, staff observes that the rezoning overall is consistent with the Imagine Carry Plan. We find that it supports policies from the live, work, shop, shape, and move chapters, and that the proposal supports the guidance found in the Eastern Carry Gateway Special Planning Area, specifically the guidance for the mixed use center commercial base designation for the Carry Town Center mall site. So this concludes staff's presentation. The applicant's representative, um, Jamie Schwaler, is here to share comments. And following that, we will be available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dry. I'll turn it over to Ms. Schwaler if you want to say a couple words. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I'm Jamie Schwadler with Parker Poe at 301 Fayetteville Street in Raleigh. I'm here on behalf of the Cary Town Center property, the new owners of the mall. And I have with me tonight and available to answer any questions, uh, Jason Davis with Turnbridge Equities, who's a uh, partnership in that uh, new ownership. Uh, I also have with me um, Alan Ward with Sasaki and Associates, an internationally recognized landscape architecture firm who's um, helped us and in instrumentally developed our master plan, as well our local development team, Travis Fluitt with Kimley Horn, our transportation engineer, and uh, Bob with Zumwalt with McAdams. Katie's done an excellent job of summarizing this exciting project. Our team has been working on this for nearly over a year and coordinating with staff on all of the, the framework that you've seen before you tonight, as well as the uh, extensive policies that are called out in the Cary Community Plan to try to develop a project that's exciting and responds to Cary's needs uh, for this area. Um, we're seeking to create a dynamic center to replace what was once at the heart of Cary, but has now uh, become an, a kind of forgotten mall that's slowly dying. And we're seeking to breathe new life into this area that's primed for rebirth. And we believe our, our request is aligned with countless uh, elements of the Cary Community Plan, um, but really most notably a key tenant of the Eastern Cary Gateway Plan, which was to breathe new life and a mix of uses into this site. Um, Consumers today are bypassing these enclosed single-story malls for goods they can purchase online or in modern centers um, with outdoor spaces and vibrant experiences. 
we are seeking to complement uh, what has already been approved in the Eastern Cary Gateway, the Fenton project, um, and offer a different experience, a new urban grid concentrating on office and residential use with supporting retail so that the project will thrive for decades to come. And to do that, we hired Sasaki, uh, an international firm that has worked on these types of uh, creating new urban spaces and revitalization projects all across the United States, including working on our uh, US Capitol and National Mall, um, as well as local projects such as the revitalization of the Moore Square in downtown Raleigh. Their vision for the site included what, what Katie showed to you earlier, which was uh, 19, or 18 pods, um, broken up throughout the site so that we create a, a new urban grid and respond to that compact form that smaller blocks of streets uh, that Katie cited in the Cary Community <coughs> Plan uh, just a moment ago. Uh, but they also wanted to put the greatest density and intensity along Carytown Boulevard to give what we envision as the office use, the prime visibility and accessibility along Carytown Boulevard. That's the area that you see uh, in blue. And so those 18 development blocks are broken up into d individual grids with three primary use types. The blue that you see there is the office and institutional. The yellow is primarily residential. The orange is the commercial urban core. And the green color that you see could be a, a mix of either office or residential or either or depending on the market and how we're able to respond. As you might imagine, a site of 87 acres being uh, brought through the redevelopment process is going to be phased and it's going to take some time. And so that leaves us enough flexibility to create a dynamic first phase and then respond to the market uh, as users uh, come along. And then within each of these uh, 18 blocks, uh, the uses are broken down into a set of uh, a list of permitted uses, as well as an individual block that calls out what can go in each of those pods. We have minimum and maximum heights. We have primary and secondary uses. And then where appropriate for the certain pods, we have individual notes that respond to the unique character of that pod. So for example, for pod one at the corner there of Maynard and Carytown Boulevard, uh, you can see the grayed out area that's a building on the corner. We have a note that commits to putting a building footprint on the corner to really frame the area. Um, in pod five, in the center of the uh, urban core, we have a dashed line that represents uh, the existing Belk building. Belk has a long-term lease on the site, and uh, we, we anticipate them to, to stay. And so we've envisioned this uh, two possibilities, the ability to build around them and redevelop around them, or if we need to repurpose the, the entire block and Belk decides to, to vacate their lease, the ability to go higher. So we've really gone to a macro level of kind of figuring out where the densities and intensities are appropriate on the site to respond to Carytown Boulevard as well as the residential along Ivy Lane. And then at the micro level of each pod, thinking about which types of uses are uh, the best for that area and how they might interact with each pod. Uh, the plan heights also include um, intensities that are, oops, <laughs> try to go to 15. Um, I wanted to go to, let's see, the 15 slide. Can we go back to that? There we go. Uh, the plan heights and intensities are appropriate for this site. As Katie mentioned, this is only one of five destination centers that the Cary Community Plan identified throughout the town. Um, and you can see that we have minimums and maximums of that overall intensity. Um, in each of the destination centers, the Cary Community Plan called for the most intensive uses uh, on the site, heights to range uh, up into the, the four to, to six and even higher. And as Katie noted in the Cary Community Plan, a specific vision for this Eastern Cary Gateway site, uh, that, that type of intensity is entirely appropriate. But we've also recognized that with that intensity, uh, there's a need for balancing out open space and creating a sustainable development that will be responsible and, and responsive to the environment. And so we've um, committed some significant commitments to open space, trees, and sustainability that offset these development intensities. Now, each of these commitments are shown on the front page of the PDP in extensive notes, but I'll summarize them here. Our commitment to open space is 17 times the requirement of the LDO for a site this, of this size. 
That means the two acres are committed in certain locations throughout the site. And they're not only committed to two acres in volume, but they're also spread throughout the site. So what you have today are key pockets of trees along the area next to uh, TAC and along Carytown Boulevard with just a, um, sporadic uh, islands and things in the center of the, of the parking lots to break up the trees. What we've done with our commitment is not only commit to these community gathering areas, but creating these new streetscapes that will pull the trees into and throughout the site so that they're not just along the streetscape or not just in the rear of the site and not just along Ivy Lane, but all throughout the site. Um, they culminate in uh, the, the main area that we saw at the outset, um, which surrounds the, <laughs> Katie, I'm having trouble here. Going back to eight. <laughs> That's good. Well, there we go. Yeah. Um, so you can see throughout each of these pods, you have the green areas, and then you also have areas that are tan with a hatched area, and that indicates these are community gathering areas, but they're covered in hardscape to be appropriate with the office use or the highly traffic areas that we anticipate with the commercial core. Uh, just to the south of the commercial core in pod six, you can see a larger area of green space that's in, envisioned to be our urban uh, oasis of sorts, to have our largest community gathering area and have the largest gathering area directly south of that community gathering space um, in the commercial area so that you have the mix of the hardscape um, with an open, a more urban oasis area. In addition to the community gathering area, we are committing to placing 1,100 new canopy trees uh, within the new grid, which is over 150% of the existing tree count. And as I mentioned, these will not only be uh, replaced in volume, but interspersed throughout the site. Today, those trees are at the edges doing very little to reduce the heat islands that are created by your suburban uh, mall parking lots. And what we're doing with creating the new streetscape and having those trees interspersed throughout the site Site not only helps for visual appeal, it helps for impervious area and absorption and reducing the heat imprint of this project at full build out. With respect to sustainability and stormwater, we've been working very closely with Matt Flynn, uh, with the, the Cary staff, and we've worked with a commitment that will um, commit to the post-development impacts of this mall being uh, reduced to have an impact on the Walnut Creek watershed. And we're doing that in two ways. We're not only reducing the impervious area of, of the site, but we're also committing to using a palette of low impact design. Those could be things like rain gardens or, or areas interspersed throughout the community gathering areas. And the combination of those two techniques um, is, is um, going to result in a situation that the peak flow of discharge is equivalent to a 10% reduction in impervious area. So what we recognize is we're removing this large impervious parking lot, we're placing buildings back in, but we're overall going to have a commitment that's the equivalent of a 10% reduction in impervious area. Um, in addition, as Katie mentioned, we're committing to increasing the green space or buffers along the corridor that are adjacent to the site. Um, this is done by including the type A berm along Ivy Lane. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off. Your time, is, uh, okay. your time is up. Okay. Thank you for your comments, though. Thank you. Um, now going to be opening up to board questions. Uh, we'll start on my left. Mr. <coughs> Hamilton. I've got a, I've got a couple. Um, and Katie, can you tell me what is a pedestrian hybrid beacon? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'd actually like to see if a transportation staff person would be able to help me with that question. I think they could explain it more eloquently gotcha. than I oh. could. Thank you. Yeah, that went right past me, too. <laughs> I didn't know if I heard it correctly. <laughs> Um, good evening, Priyatam Kanavi Transportation Facilities. Uh, a pedestrian hybrid beacon is essentially a signal for pedestrians. Uh, it would help control the traffic on the roadway, stop the traffic on roadway on both sides, and help pedestrians cross okay. in a safe manner. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. And then, then one last one. Uh, I did the math earlier, and I could be wrong. Can someone give me the percentages for how much is going to be residential, retail, and commercial? I've got 31% commercial, 10% retail leaving the rest for residential. I do not have the percentages off the top of my head, but it is in the staff report. 
Oh, Take me I just must, a minute and I can locate it. I must it. overlook it, sorry. Oh, excellent. Thank you. So um, it depends on if they're building the minimum or the maximum scenarios. If they're building the maximum, it would be 36% office, 54% residential, and 10% retail. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I do have a question for the applicant. Um, so it sounded like of that residential, a small percentage of that would be townhomes. The rest would be multi-family units, correct? Correct. Okay. And the multi-family units, would those be rented out or sold? So the townhomes we envision as a for sale product, and that would be a maximum, I think, of 175. Um, the uh, multi-family would be more your traditional rental apartments. Okay. Um, I have questions about the traffic situation there. Uh, I see that there is some concern, I think expressed by staff, about the improvements that are not being made and the potential for backups and whatnot, because those are two very major intersections there at Maynard and Carytown and Maynard and Walnut. And so just wondering how seriously does are uh, need to be taken into consideration i think you know it's wonderful to have a new space there with all kinds of ways to attract the shopping and uh, office and residential public but if people can't get around or in and out around the area then it's going to be a big concern sooner rather than later i would think so the, um, the traffic study and the staff's uh, conclusion is that at, at the project build out, those improvements would be needed. So, um, so it, it would, and, and if the applicant doesn't ultimately commit to them, those those would need to be built by the town because they would be needed for proper circulation in the area. I see. So if the developer doesn't do it, the town will. It's a nice That's incentive. <laughs> And I'd like to just address that quickly, if you don't mind. So um, one thing that would I'd like to note about the traffic report is that it showed our distribution of trips primarily occurring at that main um, Carytown Boulevard entrance that, that, that we have today. We're not changing any of those uh, entrances um, in terms of moving them or relocating them. And nearly 47% of our trips occur at that location. Uh, the, the second largest is down at Walnut Street, and a very low percentage occurs at the two intersections that we're not offering to commit. I think it's somewhere close to, to 3% for each of those. So it's a very low impact that our traffic has on those particular intersections. They were also requested of the Fenton, improvement, of the Fenton project, and Fenton declined to do those same two improvements as well. Do you have any more? I may. Go <laughs> <We can> come <laughs> back. Um, so I guess in my mind, and this is not completely a question for you, but it's the fact that the Fenton across the street, a very similar high level description of that property and then this property, um, needless to say, uh, it's a desirable change that's being proposed. I'm just wondering where is there a, dis what, is, what makes a distinction between the Fenton and this property? How are they different in terms of who they're gonna attract in terms of tenants? Is there gonna be a conflict or a competition between them or how does that, how do you see that playing out? That's a great question. Uh, the same design team worked on both projects, so we've considered uh, this before. And um, fortunately, with the success of Fenton, it really served as a catalyst for the Eastern Cary Gateway. They are, they are focused on a, a, a similar program in terms of size and scope, um, but really more of an experienced retail, um, some very high-end and kind of innovative retail that have, focuses on that main street um, and where retail really is the heart. They had a central tenant that was committed and on board um, that had a, a retail purpose. And so we were able to kind of build the project around that. Um, with this program, we're not focusing on retail. And in fact, the majority is, you know, the 1.2 million square feet of office and 1,800 uh, units with supporting retail. So the retail that we're um, committing to you here is about 360,000. Uh, it's about what's on the mall today, but in more uh, kind of drawn throughout the site in a more of a mixed use center. So instead of it kind of focused all in, in one place. Um, so two very different concepts. 
And I think it's just illustrative of when you can have uh, kind of two competing uh, areas, they both have a chance to, to, uh, to raise each other up and uh, draw a different crowd or different types of uh, retail to each site. Thank you, that's helpful. I appreciate that. I think that's all for now. I'm, I'm going to follow up on that, that same question. The, the one area in which there seems to be a, a lot of direct competition is the O&I. It, it looked like there were going to be comparable amounts of O&I in Fenton and here. And I, I suppose the question is, is there enough to absorb that much O&I when you put both projects across the road from each other with a similar amount or maybe the exact same amount of O&I? That's also a great question, Chuck. The the office is really spread in different locations in Fenton versus uh, the Cary Town Center project. In Fenton is really uh, set up on the other side of Trinity for a kind of main uh, campus. So a, a very large amount of office could locate right on the corner there, high visibility to 40. You can see it from the interchange. And then some loft office that's also sprinkled throughout uh, Fenton over the over top of the retail along that main corridor. The office Office here is much more um, kind of wrapped around the commercial core um, and not as much loft office and so we do envision those being kind of singular buildings that can come along um, as we find tenants to kind of uh, as the commercial area uh, develops so we've done um, both projects look, look to the market before um, kind of going in into this and the location on 40 the high visibility and the lack of of land that's really around makes these both very prime sp spots Okay, so if I understand, then what you're saying is there'll just be a difference in character of the O and I from one project to the other. We believe so. I mean, there's there's plenty of tenants that might want to take one or two floors. Some might want to take an entire building, and they'll look at different sites uh, for that purpose. Um, the other question I had was um, um, there was discussion about connectivity across Maynard Road to um, the shopping center across the way that then connects through to carry high school, and I don't know if I'm addressing this to you or to staff, maybe both. Um, what was envisioned when you were talking about that? Is, you were talking about a, a flyover or, or what type of connectivity? It would be a pedestrian hybrid beacon, um, which was- <laughs> Wait a second, <laughs> you, lost me. you already lost me again. <laughs> It, essentially, it would be um, a signal that would stop Thank traffic you. to allow for um, pedestrians to cross over. Um, and the town is actually um, going to be putting one in on Walnut Street to allow um, um, students of the high school to get over to the Harris Teeter Shopping Center. So that, that same type of approach is going to be used by the town um, uh, as they look, look to install that perhaps next year. And I think that's really important. For years, I had an office. And I've where the Harris Teeter is now, and I saw the kids dodging traffic, screaming across the street, and you would hide your eyes hoping that, uh, they were very quick, so it, it worked out all right. <laughs> but um, that would seem to be something that would really be necessary, and uh, I would like to see some cooperation between the two shopping centers on letting that happen. Uh, it's just something that's really needed uh, to keep us older folks from having heart attacks. So can I just clarify, so this beacon, uh, <laughs> is it basically what you're describing as a crosswalk with a light that tells people when to walk? I believe that's accurate, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Free, free of them can explain it. Got it. <laughs> uh, it's very similar to a traffic signal. It's overhead, can be um, suspended, or it can be on a mass dump. It won't have as many signal heads, it'll have fewer signal heads, and essentially it'll flash yellow and flash red and stops traffic on both sides. And pedestrians would cross at grade um, at a high visibility crossing. So, and it's activated by the pedestrians. So. Is there anything like that in Cary now? Uh, yeah, I believe uh, we've installed one on Evans Road uh, near the school. Isn't there I one near there's... the tennis park too? Yeah, on, by Ma um, on Maynard. Yeah, on Maynard. Yeah. So that one is yeah. slightly different. The, oh. that, that one's called a rapid flashing beacon. So there is no pedestrian activation. It goes automatically oh, okay. at certain times of the day. Uh, whereas this one is pedestrian activated and it stops traffic. That one just wants traffic that people are crossing. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm. All right. Good. We'll go ahead and start on this end. 
if you have any questions. Um, I do. I um, My question is about the signage standards that are in the guidebook. Um, I just, in flipping through it, there aren't really any dimensions provided. There's just a wide variety of um, photographs. Um, and so I'm just curious as to, you know, how how is the signage going to be controlled? Um, and it, if the guidebook is what's used, how does that vary from what is um, required in other parts of the town? So um, I believe that the applicant will be updating the design guidebook to include um, some more specifics when it comes to dimensional standards. Okay. And they may be able to, to speak to any, any more specifics with that. That is one area of the design guidebook we're continuing to update as we receive the comments from staff, and so I do expect to have some of that tightened up uh, likely this week or next. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to provide dimensions, um, especially if, you know, the project takes 10 years to develop. It's It would be helpful for staff to have dimensions so that they could know, like, what the limitations would be or what you're proposing. I think a, a lot of the examples are really beautiful um, and interesting and innovative, but I just would want there to be some clarity around that, um, even maybe materials, too. Oh. Yeah, I think that the, um, that's a that's a great suggestion. Um, the way the design guidebook is supposed to work is kind of the a, a template or a, a, a menu of things to be to be used. So a palette of materials is something that could easily yeah. be incorporated in. The dimensions sometimes get a little tricky because we haven't designed everything yeah. yet. But um, but I think we're happy to take that into consideration. You did a good job in other areas of the guidebook to really be a lot more explicit, and that was just one area that I noticed. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bob Zumwalt with McAdams. Hi. Um, it's a lot to take in, so I understand why. There's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> questions. Um, uh, on the signage page, um, I'm sure you can all see it from here, there are some notes on the right side of the page um, that were added very recently, and it does still need work, but we're, we're starting to hone in on exactly what you're saying. So what we're asking for is, uh, with the, the second to the last modification, we're asking to be able to exceed the dimensional requirements of the LDO by up to 25%. Um, and one of the concerns the staff mentioned was, you know, they don't want us to exceed the masonry and or flip the masonry out for EFIS, for example. So we put some text in here that basically required the percentage of the overall masonry shall remain in place. However, in order to reflect the overall architecture of the community, other high quality materials illustrated in the guidebook, such as stone, metal, wood, may be substituted for the masonry. So. We're starting to get at what you're asking for. Okay. Still trying to provide some flexibility, but then yeah. prevent you know craziness from coming in. So. Yeah, I think the flexibility is important because as we discussed in the work session, we want the development to have great character and that the buildings as they develop should be unique and interesting. And yeah, okay. thank you, Bob. Thank you. Th that was it, that was my only question. Anything else? Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, um, it, it is very refreshing that you're you're moving to parking decks and eliminating that mass of, of concrete out there. I, I do question or have a concern about double the reduction from the town standards, the thirty percent reduction. I know over the years that it's going to take to build this. It's possible that the way people commute could change, but if you look at the history of this area, and even today, you know, public transit just isn't big here. And I w I'm just worried that because of that big reduction in parking that it could, you know, I assume you're gonna have events, you're gonna have a hotel that's gonna probably have a ballroom having events, and the parking could get pushed over to the residential areas, which wouldn't be good. So. That would be my only question, you know, was can you go up higher in a parking deck to help preserve some of that? 30% just seems like a, a really big number unless you're counting on the way people travel changing in the future. 
That's a good point. I mean, I think we've seen several of the multifamily requests come through the town that are asking it to about that level. Um, and it's a combination of several mm. factors. One, I think they're looking at their actual market demand when they're making these requests and saying, for a typical multifamily product, we just don't need as much parking as the code requires. Um, but with this site in particular, I think there's several factors. One, we've committed to kind of accommodating uh, an, a transit route through that blue center line, uh, which should help. Uh, there's not, I think there's a kind of a, a pathway now, but it's not really documented and it's kind of over several different roads. And so once we're at full build out, there'll be much more predictable transit method within the site. Um, there's also discussions of BRT coming down um, Carytown Boulevard. That is yet to be determined, but that could significantly change uh, the way people traverse to the site. Um, and then the mix of uses itself really creates a great opportunity for um, combined parking at different rates of peak. So the office is not using the parking at the same time the residential is. Um, if you do have events, that's usually at an off time for your office users as well. Um, so we really have looked carefully at the program and think that this balance really strikes the right note with what we're seeing in the market as well as the, that combination of factors. Okay. Um, just another question, I'm, and I think I, I want to make sure I got this right, I'm, the new subject, trees. Um, also commend you on planting 1,000 new trees. I think that's, that's fantastic. Over on the Ivy Lane side, um, I think the presentation said you're going to preserve the champion trees that are on that side. Is that did I see that correct? Yeah, I believe you can see it just slightly on this plan. Uh, I don't want to touch the screen, but up towards that little triangle where TAC is closest, and then there's two others right along the property line. Uh, oh, there they are. Where Ivy Lane is. So those are um, to be preserved, and then the rest of the berm is not only committed as a uh, zoning commitment, but as Katie mentioned, we're going to make sure that that's up to uh, a type A standard that is not today. So we're preserving that and making sure that that berm is going to, to be improved from what you see today. And then the, the other champion trees, they're, they're just in, there's nothing wrong with the trees, they're just in areas where it would be awkward to develop around them. They are. They're mostly around the perimeter um, near Carytown Boulevard and Maynard. And if you look at um, their locations and the new streetscapes that we're creating as well as uh, the new street grid that we're creating, it's not possible to, to preserve them and have this mix of intensity um, along with the topography. Okay, and then just one last, just back over to Ivy Lane, because we, we talked a lot about Ivy Lane with a previous development that was going to be here. Um, and you're going to take a, a good look at, th there's a really nice buffer there today, and, I, and it's great that you're keeping it and that there's going to be residential, but you're going to take a good look at that to make sure that those folks are getting as much screening as possible. Cor correct. The, the standard um, that we're committing to is the type A, and then when we go into the development plan, we're going to actually have to, I think, evaluate what's out there and figure out how to bring it up to that standard. So that'll that'll be a more specific looking at what's out there today and, and what we're going to change. Okay, and this is the last one, and again, I'm still over at Ivy Lane. The, the lighting that's going to be on that side of the development, the lighting will be such that they're not going to be getting excessive light pollution from the development over in the Ivy Lane area where those folks live? That's correct. The The way that, that we've envisioned this is that the, all of the yellow you see there are um, multifamily or, or uh, residential uses. We envision most of that having kind of wrapped parking decks, and so most of that would be internally lit. Um, but then the, the carry LDO has certain requirements on pole height and direction, and so we would be required to meet all of those standards as well. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Is my turn? Yes, it yeah. is. All right. Thanks. <clears throat> First of all, uh, thanks to uh, to Ms. Dry and the entire uh, staff um, for all the work they've been doing. I personally appreciate uh, Scott Berry and, and Katie for the last 72 hours answering a lot of questions as I've been trying to get up to speed on that. And uh, thank you for the applicant for all your both work as well as listening. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, I have a number of questions. I'll try to keep them focused, and some of them I can direct to staff, and some I'll throw to either uh, Ms. Wedler or Ms. Dry, and you can, you know, however they want to go. Yeah, I'm going to go back to what you started off with, with the parking, because 
I do appreciate where we've seen with some multifamily and we've seen some data, but we've also had cases that have come in here where the new office environment where it's much more dense and we've seen some cases where we had zoning that was looking to be able to increase parking because of the need for density gone are the day of the rabbit warrens as we all know of you know everybody has an eight by ten or a ten by ten now in the open environment there's much more density um, so I'm just kind of looking at the staff about weighing that out. I mean, we know that some of the multifamily we've been doing may be able to, parking requirements may be a little excess, but I weigh that out. I think about a project in Regency recently of where basically the request was they needed more parking density than what, what, what was actually allowed in there. <clears throat> so back to that 30%, and I guess, you know, is, I appreciate wanting to have the administrative efficiency, but at the same token, you know, and maybe that's for the applicant because I'm also wondering, and this is the market at work, and that's not for our, but I also times think about, we have the shared parking deck, but, you know, tenants are going to want, if I was leasing that space in a prior life, I would have been demanding dedicated parking for my employees. I, they weren't going to be looking uh, for par parking spaces. So I'm just wondering how all that kind of meshes out. Just. To, I'll start and provide some information, and then I think it would be best for me to turn it over to the applicant. But I will note that mm -hmm. the modification is set up so that as part of the development plan process, the planning director may grant the reduction of up to 30% if a justification is submitted and it's found to be satisfactory. So it would have to be um, a reduction that's granted on a case-by-case -case basis with a specific justification turned in. So those are the parameters that are set up. So they're not they're getting 30% out of the box. They, right. Okay. They would have to make their case. So it allows um, the 15% now that the man, that the director can, can be on. So it's just giving that leeway instead of having to go through the full administrative process. So. Yes. And then I think I'm going to turn it over to the applicant if you guys have more context to add right. to that. <clears throat> Casey, Casey, that's good that's exactly what I was going to say. We will have to perform, Kimley Horn would have to provide a parking study at the time we started to understand the square footage is the type of uses. Um, the mix of residential to uh, office at that point if we could justify cross parking and support it with data then it just gives the planning director the ability to approve it without going back so that's really what it is okay thank you I think that's all I have for parking so let me move on to um, a serious question about roads and transportation of, as we look at all the, um, I guess it's 18 different, call them, I call them pods. What did you refer to them as? as pods. Pods, okay, all right. So we have 18 pods and there's a whole street network there. Has it been determined which of those streets that are going to become, I guess, the towns, um, be, be town owned and maintained versus the applicant and the development? I mean, is that still being worked out? Or, or are they all expected to be, once they're completed, they'll be, I mean, I'm all the way down to, you know, cleaning and remove, removal of snow and the whole nine yards, so. We haven't made the decision whether and which will be private versus public, except for the townhomes. We have made the decision, that, the commitment that those will be designed to public street standards. Okay, and the townhomes are located on the east side, 15, pods 15, 16, 17, and that area there. So also, on the north side of the property, there are several existing um, properties, uh, Triangle Aquatic Center, the Wake County Public Schools, uh, North Carolina Baptist, uh, there's a retirement community, et cetera. So that road back there, I guess, will have to remain on the north perimeter will be, that will be um, a public, that'll be a public way. Correct. So Convention Drive is public to about the property line in front of the Baptist uh, headquarters, mm -hmm. and um, we'll have to maintain that uh, throughout and keep that access. Okay. And speaking of those um, properties to the north, I know that some of them have enjoyed the spillover of, of the access for the parking in there, in the, I guess it's really for the, for the staff. And knowing that TAC has a development um, that's been approved, they're still going to have to be responsible for on-site parking. They won't have the luxury of using basically the, the overflow in the mall. Like having right. had kids on swim teams, I know that well. 
And it's one of the um, recently approved plans for Triangle mm -hmm. Aquatic Center. Um, they did have a parking expansion um, approved, so they're, that, that's something that they are working on. Okay. All right. So the, the world will not be as it once was. Uh, so it, it, if I understood correctly, there's still ongoing discussion, but it's not a condition for this property in terms of um, go triangle transit or you know, there's various entities to be able to pass through there or, you know, onto the site itself. There may be bus stops at Walnut or Maynard or Cary Town, but in terms of that, so that's something that's still to be determined, I guess. At this time, that, the, the town has identified that <clears throat> um, the north-south collector. Um, yeah, that's that's the blue one. This that kinda... blue, this blue right, route here would be the preferred route for local go carry transit operations to occur. Mm -hmm. And the applicants have proposed to um, commit to working with town staff on finding appropriate locations for bus stops along this corridor. Okay, so at least the intent is there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if we can get it into it as a condition of some sort, that'd be great. Um, back to, I guess, as we're, I'm kind of moving outward. So now we're going out to the to the traffic study. Um, and, I, you know, as we look at the, so the, the two elephants in the room are basically Carytown and Maynard and Maynard and Walnut, because those are the two that I appreciate the applicant where people are going to be directly accessing, they're taking care of that. But having lived in Cary for 31 years, I remember when that mall was small and busy. Um, traffic in those two intersections are, were a nightmare back in 1988. And, uh, you know, I, I just kind of, I'm, I'm wrestling with, and I'm not a traffic engineer, um, with the numbers of looking at, I saw a statement that from the applicant that if the mall was utilized to its full capacity as it is now, the traffic would be, on the new development would be about equal to that. And it's, so I guess the question maybe for staff is, so if the mall in, was fully utilized, you know, robust maximum, what we'd expect, the question I have is, would the road uh, is the roads uh, the traffic signaling uh, the intersections adequate for that i mean what i'm getting back what i'm really one of my core pieces is uh, i don't mean the i won't to is this case for me has raised some fundamental questions as to whether we have the right tools for doing large redevelopment in the town of Cary. and this is a case and it's not to be put on the applicant but i'm kind of looking at this maybe Maybe I'll say from my comments that there's some limitations. Stormwater is one of those, and traffic is one where we say, okay, so if the mall was robust, we'd have this many trips, which is equivalent equal to what the new development would be. But I'd say, well, that's great, but if the roads were inadequate for that, then it's you know this isn't getting any better. So I mean, I'm just any th thoughts on? Uh, I mean, I, what I see is down the road that we're going somebody's going to need to deal deal with that, but. Yeah, so we can start by um, addressing your, your first question about the, the intersections and if the mall was operating at full capacity. And I think I'd like to turn it over to Priyam to help me address that question. Sure. Hi, um, you have a valid question. So the two intersections, Maynard and Carrington Boulevard and Walnut and Maynard are probably the more critical intersections. If the mall were operating today, full capacity, um, improvements would most likely be required at uh, Maynard and Walnut. Maynard and Carrington Boulevard, there is some residual capacity left. We haven't done that analysis, so I cannot tell you for sure uh, if we would need additional improvements today. Um, but also, uh, going, going taking a step back, the traffic study was done assuming that the mall would be redeveloped in one step. So wouldn't, the phasing wasn't factored in. So those improvements would be absolutely needed once the mall reaches its full build out as mm -hmm. proposed. And that could be 10 years from now, maybe a little bit longer, I'm not quite sure of that. So once that happens, the traffic patterns could have shifted, that would give us some time to evaluate, okay, where it is um, appropriate to make improvements rather than trying to commit to them today. Uh, but yes, you're right, those two intersections could, could use some improvements. Okay. I'd like to sure. address that just quickly, Please. if I could. Yeah. Please. 
So um, I, I agree with, with Priyatham about the, the way that the traffic report was done. I think it really gets back to the fundamental um, kind of point of doing the traffic uh, improvements in connection with the development, and that is that's the flip side of the coin is if we did nothing with the site and leased it all up, we still wouldn't be responsible for any of those improvements. It'd still be a town obligation because we wouldn't be doing any new development. So it's a problem that's pre-existing and not something that should squarely fall on, on our shoulders. Um, we recognize that they're important um, traffic improvements, but we don't think that that's something that's that's squarely on the full build out, um, the the plate of the full build out. And the other thing I'd like to note is that we don't control the corner where the gas station is, so it's difficult to do improvements there. We have committed to doing a, a northbound um, right turn lane on off of Maynard onto Carytown Boulevard. So people trying to come up Maynard and then getting out to 40, uh, we are doing a, a, a turn lane there. Um, the rest of the intersection is severely um, cramped by right-of-way constraints and the retaining wall on the other side of the street with Harris Teeter. So uh, it's not just a matter of whether we want to pay for things or not. There's some real constraints out there that make those intersections challenging. Um, mm -hmm. There's a reason why they've both been uh, ha had difficulty there. So we're doing what we can to to bring a really vibrant um, center here, but it doesn't come with some challenges. So. Good. Thanks. And so what I want on the traffic and before everybody leaves. So, so we talked about the two where they aren't being addressed, but on the other ones, and I looked at the traffic study, but just helped refresh me. There's the entrance on the north side at uh, at Kerry Town, and then there's three entrances off of Walnut Street. Those, and there's also two coming into Maynard. So there are improvements that are being addressed in there. I'm looking at staff on that. Yes, it, the applicant is offering to complete improvements at all of their entrances. So the improvements were they all? <clears throat> the, all the improvements that were made by the traffic study, or just some of them, or um, all of them? All of them. Okay. But all of them. <coughs> okay. And nothing's being addressed at this time with Ivy Lane, Ivy Lane to Walnut Street. That's still because that's not part of the property. I just want to make sure that okay, that's still it's still okay. That's still. I mean, it's it's an issue, but it's not going to be addressed by this. Um, question on streetscape. <clears throat> Actually, I got a couple questions on streetscape, if I could. Um, who's going to maintain all that streets, all that beautiful, all those beautiful pictures of, uh, you know, five feet and or ten feet and twenty feet, et cetera? Is that going to be maintained? Is that going to be uh, given to the town, or is that the applicant who's going to be responsible? And what I'm always thinking about is, so we see a lot of development at master plan and as it gets built out it all looks great and then 10 years later nobody's maintained mulch trees have died because of compaction etc cetera, etc cetera. shrubs die and so on yeah. much of the streetscape on the perimeter roads um, such as walnut street maynard um, carrytown um, boulevard would be um, not within the right of way and they would be located within the the site itself so it would okay. be the responsibility of <clears throat> property owners to, to maintain that streetscape. Um, within the internal um, site, uh, some of the streetscape, which which would not be a traditional street, streetscape, it would be the tree planting areas. Um, it would depend on whether or not some of those roads become publicly owned and maintained roads by the town or if they remain private. And that's still um, undetermined at this time. So it could be um, could be a mixture. Some of it could be privately maintained. Some of it could be town maintained. Okay. Question on what's the definition of a canopy tree? I mean, what, what's the town define? I mean, there's over a thousand canopy trees being offered, but I, I, what does a canopy tree look like at planting, and what does it look like when it's at maturity? It's small, <laughs> big. <laughs> yeah, I could give you, you a definition. <laughs> I could give you a definition, but I'd love to refer to um, Doug Loveland, who's one of our plan reviewers, who could give you a, a much better, better definition than I could. Thank you. I, Thank Doug you. Loveland, planning department. I don't know if I can give you an exact definition either. They're generally upper story trees, so I can uh, also give you examples of oaks, maples, uh, zelkovas, elms. Uh, so you're thinking upper story in uh, contrast to an understory tree. So uh, maturity, they're going to be 30 feet. 50 to 70. 50 to 70. That's what we're looking for. for. Okay. For a full size uh, canopy or upper story tree. All right. So with 100, and, so over a thousand canopy trees, if we look out 30, 40 years from now, whoever's managing all that property and area is going to have a leaf problem. <laughs> That'd be. I mean, that's good to have. I mean. <laughs> 
<laughs> They'll also have shade. They'll have shade. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm being, it, it, I'm sorry. Yes, we, you're absolutely right. I don't mean to be facetious about the leaf problem, but it is about shade. And I appreciate the comments that were made earlier by the applicant's representative about urban heat island and, and et cetera. And I appreciate that. I mean, it, it's real. Because, and it, because it's, what we have out there now is, you know, is just one big, large urban heat island um, with, you know, 80 acres approximately of impervious surface. Um, and I'll get the impervious surface in a minute because I have a couple other questions just about trees and buffers. And so on the north side, on the Carytown Boulevard side, I'm trying to look at the preliminary um, development plan. There's a tree buffer. Um, the, the larger trees aside, there's basically a tree buffer there now. And I'm just wondering, is the applicant, are they developing up to the street? Or is there a line there where there's an existing, as I drove in this morning, the, tonight, um, on Carytown Boulevard, and some nights there is a traffic issue already there. But um, there's a whole bunch of trees there. Um, and so would they be remaining? Is that part of a right of way? I'm kind of. Or is that fall under a no man's land? I mean, it wasn't part of the champion trees. I appreciate the champion trees, and we often think about champion trees, but then there's, you know, there's a couple hundred other trees in and around that property besides those half, you know, those handful of big ones. Sure. So uh, the as, as Jamie and Katie mentioned, the highest amount of density on the site is concentrated here at the corner of Carytown and Maynard. And so you can see here the outline of a probably a six to eight level parking deck. And so there is about mm -hmm. 30 feet of grade change between Carytown Boulevard and this road. So it drops down. You can probably notice it as you circle in. So the idea is that this parking deck would be terraced into that slope and it would drop down a couple levels. And most likely what would happen was in order to get this all built, there would not be anything preserved. There will not be anything preserved on site. It will be revegetated. Uh, anything you would save next to a six level parking deck, it, it probably wouldn't do well to start with. Um, there are some trees in the Cary Tumble Road right away, I believe. Is it, sure that's, many, that's what I'm, like, I'm looking yeah. at what's north of that dotted line. I think that, I mean, some of this is shadow from the aerial okay. being taken at an angle, but I believe you're correct. There are, there's probably a 30 or 40 feet of, I'm guessing, between the existing back of curb and our, and our um, property line, there's probably 30 or, 40 okay. feet in well, that, there. That's what I'm thinking about. I mean, it, it, we don't sometimes look at it. I noticed yeah. it when I was driving in tonight mm -hmm. that I was looking, you know, I've looked at the champion trees, yeah. but I was like, really, well, there's just already this kind of this tree. I just didn't know. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, I'm almost done. Um, I'm sorry. So let's, on the impervious surface um, and in the stormwater, so the proposal, the applicants, a 10% reduction in, in impervious surface. I'm, I'm looking, thinking about impervious surface. I'm also going to tie this back to stormwater. Um, you know, the whole site now is impervious, and I'm trying to understand the 10%, and I appreciate low impact development, et cetera, but we still have rooftops. You know, I mean, I look at it mainly, it's going to be lands some landscape, so it's there, but, you know, this is, gets back at we have a site. We have an 80-acre site that was built before we had stormwater regulations, and right now the standard is as long as you don't make it any worse, you're okay. You're offering to come in at 10%. Uh, I'm looking at you, but I guess maybe staff, I'm sorry. But it's, you know, I'm trying to think, is that the best we can do? I mean, we have, you know, is... And I guess I'm just wondering, maybe the, the applicant to help me walk through that 10% and better understanding of, you know, what that magnitude really does get, gain, gain us. So, Yeah, I, th I think you actually summarized it well as far as what the town can require. Mm -hmm. um, because the site was built before stormwater regulations, um, any... In, um, anything that they do to redevelop, as long as they're reducing impervious, they, they're not subject to today's um, regulations because they're not increasing the impervious. Um, so anything above and beyond that is a voluntary condition that the applicants are committing to, and they may be able to, to talk more to that. And, and maybe just even from, 
if you could tell me in gallons, I mean, it'd give me some something visual I can understand. I don't know what the ten percent reduction is. I mean, I do, I, but it. I don't know what that really looks like. So I don't know what the runoff is there, and I'm not sure what what problems, if any, are already coming from there. It's more and, than we can drink. I can tell you that. Well, <laughs> so it's, it's bigger than this cup. All right, that's more than ten percent. Right, I, I got you. I mean, but it's. I, I, and, and I guess you know it, enough on the technical. I mean, are we talking about a five-year event, a ten-year, twenty? What are we measuring this against? And this is where I'm looking at staff. The. I really want to understand um, because I guess for so with this is. I guess as you're looking at stormwater, is are we looking at it like on a per pod basis, or is it going to be like the master plan? Here's the here's the 17, 18 pods, and all the streets and everything, and and that's and we do the math, and that's the number, and then you work backwards from there for each. You know, basically you hope that the the parts equal the, the, the equal the whole. When you is is that. Obviously, I'm not an engineer, so well, I'm not either. Um, <laughs> but I know enough to uh, landscape architects are a little. We're kind of good at a lot of things, but we're not fantastic at any one thing. So <laughs> let me see if I can uh, put it in layman's terms. I can relate. So what I can say is that um, we have one of the best stormwater departments in the country in our office, and the town of Cary has one of the best stormwater engineers in Matt Flynn, and so. They have been working really closely together. We've brought in Bill Hunt from NC State. He's having input. Um, David Schaus has been meeting with us in our office. We've had a couple meetings with him. And we have been working on this language also with Scott and his team. And so let me just tell you where it stands right now. So the, uh, the way I understand it is we will not be out there reducing 10% in impervious. There's not going to be 10% less pavement. But what we are going to do is study what's out there today. We're taking pre-development measurements on all the discharge points of the water. So we're figuring out where all the basins drain and how much flow is coming off. Mm -hmm. Then since we're not <clears throat> taking 10% away, because if we took 10% away, it, it, there'd be a 10 acre park somewhere in one spot. And we, we really want it to be more of an urban setting. What, what Matt has asked us to consider, which we've done, is we're looking at a a study area that would go at the end of the day will combine a reduction of impervious which as you can see we haven't figured out exactly where all the impervious is with these bubbles but we're thinking our impervious reduction might be in the four to five percent less of actual less impervious that remains to be seen because we haven't designed everything but what we will do is then we will uh, add additional stormwater controls like rain gardens infiltration areas we're talking about potentially putting um, uh, there could be in the, the street section between the back of curb and the sidewalk, we could put uh, infiltration devices in there. And combining all the low impact development with the reduced uh, impervious that we will be able to show at the end of the project that there will be the equivalent of had we reduced 10%. And that is in the peak flow. In the peak flow matching, it will be in the 1, 2, 5, 10, 25, and 100 year storms. Okay. Yeah. So it's all of those. So there's a team, if a, is a, an interdisciplinary team, the town, your staff with McAdams, great respect for both. Sasaki too. Yeah. This is Sasaki, Bill Hunt um, yep. from the state, or you know, and, and kind of looking at what's what's the baseline, trying yes. to do a benchmarking basically. What's the benchmark now on that site, and then you have a number to drive towards. That's right. I'm looking at staff. Is that? Yeah. So kind of like what? Okay. Yep. All right. Thanks. All right. I'll go to you. I think I got all of them. <laughs> if we need to come back, we can double back over. Right. Um, I want to first thank uh, staff um, for the opportunity to review this at our work session last week. Um, it was very helpful to kind of get this in front of us early and give us a preview. Uh, I think it definitely uh, answered a lot of questions and, and allowed us to kind of come into this meeting, uh, you know, kind of understanding what's going on here. Um, I do have a few questions for staff. Um, first one is hotels. Uh, which of the pods would hotels be allowed? Are those just commercial, commercial residential? Give me just a moment. Sure. So hotels are allowed in um, block three and four. Those are in the office and institutional blocks up here at the top. 
Yep, also allowed in one and two. Sorry, I'm studying, studying this sheet to make sure I give you the right information. So these four blocks that are up here at Carytown and Maynard. Mm -hmm. um, there's also hotel allowed in um, block five, which is the commercial. Excuse me, let me make sure I'm this commercial okay. pod. Mm -hmm. um, there's a potential for hotel in blocks seven, eight. No, oh, excuse me. Seven, nine, ten, eleven. So seven here, nine, ten, eleven. So what what you'll see essentially is um, if this is the this is the commercial area, um, you'll see that generally this ring around that is where some of the hotels could go. Okay, but they would not be allowed in any of the par uh, pods. I'm sorry, uh, that were adjacent to Ivy Lane. No, that's correct. Okay, um, and then my next question is about the appearance standards in the guidebook. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about how those relate to conditions? Is the guidebook itself considered a condition, or how does staff evaluate those? Yeah, so the um, design guidebook is submitted as a zoning condition as part of the rezoning application, and um, it's intended to um, provide guidance for um, the design of the site. So when the individual development plans come in, the plan reviewers, um, as well as the applicant's team is going to be using the design guidebook to um, come up with the design and then our plan reviewers are going to be using it to evaluate the design and uh, they're going to use a combination of the pictures that are shown in the design guidebook as well as the text to guide um, whether it's substantially meeting the intent of the guidebook. Thanks for clarifying that. I, I do like the applicant submitting the guide. It's the same with Fenton. Um, it's really helpful to have a guidebook and be able to kind of see, and then knowing that that's a condition. I mean, a lot of applicants come up here and give us pretty pictures about what they want to build. Um, it's not a condition. There's nothing, right, exactly, that's holding them to it. Um, knowing that the guidebook itself is a condition and the staff is um, going to work with the applicant to make sure that that vision's met, I think is very helpful. Um, did anyone else have any questions or? Anything you want to bring up? If not, I'll uh, look for a motion. I'll make a motion. Um, I move that the board find case number 19 REZ 11 is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all other actual plans, the reasons set forth in the staff report, presentation, and discussion by the planning and zoning board. Do we have a second? Second. Third. Uh, <laughs> 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 right. this off. Yeah, just, uh, just a couple of, uh, first of all, I think you know this area again we've talked about this a couple of times i hope this is is successful i mean the area definitely needs a lot of help um, there's not going to be anything perfect that goes and i think over the next few years there's going to be a lot of issues that need to be worked out i mean i'm still concerned about the parking the roads are i, I just don't see how that is not going to be an issue you know eventually but there's a lot of other really good overriding things that you have provided with us so even though there's work to be done just to kind of a as a citizen's perspective i know the town council will have to work hard with this but i think it will be good for caring yeah i think the uh, <clears throat> intensity of the planning that's gone into this is really quite impressive and um is reassuring that um, that what we're seeing on paper is is more likely to happen than not. So um, um, my my only concern is has already been expressed about uh, long-term traffic concerns um, that will uh, need to be addressed. But um, I think the applicant has has done a, a lot of what was requested uh, and showed up in the traffic study. Um, so. Um, much of that, they've they've met all their requirements, and they've uh, probably gone beyond that. Uh, so I think that's helpful. So I think it's an, a very impressive plan, and I'm I'm glad to uh, support it. I agree with Chuck. A lot of planning, and very well articulated in terms of showing us what the the road construction and the access and all those things that are important to getting around and through a plot this size. So. Um, I share your concerns about the traffic 
and about those intersections in question, but um, I think it's a little bit reassuring to know that as this thing evolves over a period of time that hopefully there'll be an opportunity to address those and figure out what the best solution is as we see what materializes. I'm most worried, as you expressed earlier, about the high school students, but yeah. a certain amount of personal responsibility is involved with every action. <laughs> so I have to assume that they will develop those things in due time. Um, I would like to say, too, that um, it's really great to see the mall property being redeveloped. Um, I love the scale of the walkable blocks, um, that you're bringing uses to this part of, the, of Cary that are needed um, for the further growth and development of our community. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's a great project, and I'm happy to support it. Good luck. Um. I, I think that the project is very strong in a lot of areas, and I do think that it does align to the town plan. Um, I really like that since our working session, there's been more um, intention or commitment around connecting to properties both on the east and the west side. I think that's really important for the pedestrians to be able to cross into the different um, into the different properties. I like the intention of bringing in more public transit. I think that that's going to be really important. Um, with the project this size, I'll say that um, one thing that I was disappointed to not see it align with the, the town plan is affordable housing. Given the number of multifamily rental apartments that are gonna be in there, it would be really great to have some affordable housing I understand there's no um, incentive right now for you to do that, um, but I think that is really important, and I think it would also better support some of the work policies that are in there. I'm glad, Ryan, that you asked about the hotel. I made some assumptions of where that would be at. Um, I do have a concern about it being in pod five, because that seems to be where the highest community gathering or the largest community gathering space is going to be and so coupling a community gathering area with a very transient sort of population by nature I don't think um, works as well so that that would be my concern about having it in pod five um, other than that I I really appreciate the strict um, design guidelines as well that's it. Uh, I agree with most of what's been said. Uh, this is an exciting project, and, and I really want it to happen. I think it will happen. But I, here's where the, the care community plan kind of puts me in a where I don't fully understand it. Uh, should be f general guidelines is the term used. 40 to 65 percent retail. This is only 10. Uh, significant room for employment. Take away all that retail is what what is considered for me. What is considered significant. Uh, and then one last one should be four to six stories, but could go higher. When they wrote this up, it was 12 stories okay? Uh, just Those are just some things that don't totally fit. I'm going to vote for it, but it's just the, the way the plan's written, this doesn't jive with. You know, it, it's a good point. Um, and the plan's not perfect. I kind of looked at some of those equations just between Fenton and this and trying to think there's a balance of because we want both of them to be economically viable because I think the point was made earlier about, you know, they're competing against each other, they kind of cannibalize the same markets and they may, but, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this project and I appreciate the applicant and all the work they, do, they put into it and the staff has put into it a lot of work sessions. And I realized the things that I have a lot of concerns about are not necessarily ones that can be should be you know put on like this application because I thought about it and said well no matter what it was the same issues are going to be there you know whether we have the adequate tools for dealing with storm water particularly as we look at redevelopment I mentioned this earlier and I think the same thing with traffic I mean I started wondering is oh, why can't we do like a payment in lieu for traffic to go towards those two major interest sections because what's going to happen is you know we've already know what the next traffic bond is going to be for. I mean, you know, we just passed one and we know that somewhere down the road there's going to be another traffic bond because, you know, it's going to be, even though these are all DOT streets, we're going to pay for them. 
but that's not the applicant. I mean, that's basically a town issue. You know, I agree with you on affordable housing. Um, I said it at Fenton. I said it. I'll say it here. It's a lost opportunity. But I also say because the town doesn't know what it would ask for. So I look at that as where we are. My opinion on with the affordable housing, you know, affordable housing strategy. My strategy is we be focusing on the workforce, folks making fifteen to twenty-five dollars an hour, thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year, which puts you at less than half the median income of uh, of, of carry, which um, is the one of the benchmarks that's used in looking at affordable housing. So to how we do it, but you know we don't know what the ask would be outside of saying well, the applicant do something. It'd say, well, what do you want us to do? It's like. I, I don't know, give us, you know. So it's, it, and I, put, I see that on our end, it's like, you know, whoever the applicant was, and I'm looking at 1,800 units, and it's like, heck, I can think of lots of models out there across the country that have worked. I can think of a bunch that haven't. But again, that gets back at, you know, the roads, the, the stormwater, you know, basically on a pre development site this large. Affordable housing is, you know, unless we had something definitive, a stake in the ground to say this is where we want to be. Can, can we ask the applicant to be there? It's hard. And so I've thought about it. It's, it's not enough, you know, so the altruistic reasons aren't enough to say no. And I think it's been a lot of work. And I sit here and I think about a great design team. Turn, you know, the applicant doesn't, you know, this is not speculation on their part. This is real money and a real commitment. And they're in it for the long haul. You look at what they've done nationally. And the team they put together, you know that they're looking that, you know, they're looking for a winner. And, you know, we know that that's an area that just needs to get what's there now, erase it. And I think it checks a lot of boxes, a lot of boxes. And I think within the plan, I think we can look at anything that says, doesn't check this one perfectly, but when we think that's where it's, you know, form-based planning, it's like, yeah, it all kind of fits. So uh, I'll vote the yes for it. But. Um, well, I'll go ahead and start by saying, um, my time on the board, this is actually the third rezoning I've seen for the mall area. Um, <laughs> having said that, I will say this is definitely the most uh, holistic um, and actually the most, uh, you know, that I'm most excited for in that it really truly is a redevelopment of the mall. Um, I think we all agree that that's something that's definitely in need of redevelopment. Um, and, you know, I'm very excited for a proposal like this that comes in and really looks at the entire site um, at as a rezoning and redevelopment effort. And, and I applaud the applicant for that. Um, I also applaud them for how they're tapering down the building heights. Uh, one of the concerns I had was, um, I'm sure the same concern that a lot of those uh, residents on Ivy Lane expressed, uh, which is the building heights of those uh, pods, which are adjacent to them. Um, I like how the plan does provide the tapering and is putting the higher density on the opposite end of the parcel. Uh, I think that's really helpful. Uh, one of the concern, biggest concerns I had, um, I'll echo Mr. Hamilton's on that, is the lack of commercial. Um, one of the things that I really thought in reading the plan was that this would have a big emphasis on commercial. Um, that's one of the things I'm really not seeing with the, the low amounts of commercial as compared to other developments. Um, I don't see it as being that big of an issue in that you obviously have Fenton catty corner to this parcel. Um, that kind of makes up for a lot of that. So. I don't think that's a big deal, but that is one of the, the big detractors that I see. Um, again, the design book I think was very helpful, um, the applicants uh, putting that together and, and kind of helping to see how it's going to feel. Um, reading the Eastern Cary Gateway special planning area, I kind of envision that as being a very urban center. Um, I think this plan meets that specifically. I think this is going to provide a very urban development, have a very urban look and feel, and I think because of that it I think really fits with what the Cary community plan is asking for there. Um, does anyone else have any comments or ready for a vote? Uh, would all those in favor of the motion uh, to find this consistent, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you. Our next item on our agenda is the Act 8 Land Development Ordinance and Community Appearance Manual Amendments. And that would be Mrs. Grannon presenting that to us this evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. So it's an exciting time for Cary. We've got the Imagine Cary Community Plan adopted, and now we're going through the fun exercise <laughs> of looking for opportunities <laughs> to implement it. And with that process, we've discovered there's some opportunities that our ordinance and our community appearance manual can better align to help some of these developments 
come to fruition. And it's also an opportunity to maybe help promote some public and private partnerships and stimulate some development. So with recognizing those opportunities before you tonight is a small step, but an important step to look at amendments to the way we look at density, uh, height measurements and minor modifications, updates to the community appearance manual. Some of those regulations are pretty strict, so it's a chance to look at a little more flexibility. And then to look at quasi-judicial requirements and when those are appropriate. So when it comes to density, basically density is the number of dwelling units you can put on an acre. Um, when you look at the town center, uh, you've got caps today for the HMXD district that caps you at 50 dwelling units per acre and the MXD that caps you at 25. Um, a best planning practice and what's becoming more and more common in other municipalities is to not just use these arbitrary numbers but to look at the form and the shape of the building and look at the market and what's demanding. Um, you can't really tell by looking at a building what the density is inside that building. So use the height of the building, use the parking requirements, use some of the design standards to help define the density. So what we're proposing is to remove the density caps and let those other factors help drive the way the density would be determined for the building. So, you know, looking at a building like this, you might have some really small units inside. You might have a mix of uses inside the building, but you've still got those building heights. You've still got, you know, certain design elements in place that are going to help you get a really good looking quality building and then help to meet some of our goals of getting higher densities in the town center and, you know, stimulating some of the economic development opportunities and the viability of the community. When it comes to height, right now, Carrie's LDO measures the height of a building depending on the type of roof. And currently, the height of a building with a parapet, and the parapet is that visible wall on the outside of the building, uh, right now we measure to the uh, top of the building parapet. So what the LDO um, amendment is proposed to do is to stop measuring to the top of that parapet and instead measure to the roof line. Why would we want to do this, you ask? <laughs> well, that's because you could then look at having some opportunities to activate that rooftop and create some more either recreation space or gathering spaces. It's also an opportunity to hide HVAC equipment. You know, rather than going to the top of that parapet, you could use the attractive parapet that looks like the outside of the building and that becomes your screening. So that becomes an opportunity to make the building look better. We're looking at also recommending a minor modification to height. Uh, right now, um, what's proposed is that the planning director would be able to allow a 15% modification to allow an increase of the building height only in certain cases, and that's when the building is a mixed-use building, or not necessarily a mixed-use building, but part of a mixed-use development, um, that it's located in a destination center or the town center, and if it's subject to a development agreement. So right now, the planning director can look at a 15% modification to building setbacks and parking standards. It made sense that you know, the planning director should also be able to apply that, but there was some concerns, you know, from the council. Building height's pretty important. It's pretty important to everybody, um, to the town council members, to the board, um, to the citizens. So that's why this is very limited. So that it would only apply if all three of those conditions applied. And that it's been updated in the staff report, but I missed it on the slide. It wouldn't just be to mixed-use buildings, but it would be to buildings that are part <coughs> of a mixed-use development. The next is the amendment proposed to the Community Appearance Manual and update. And this is really um, a minor modification, something that we've been looking at for a long time. It's to allow the opportunity for metal panels and fiber cement panels to be used to meet that masonry requirement that we've got. When the CAM was first approved and established in 2003, it called for high quality masonry materials such as brick, cast stone, form con concrete, 
and this included um, this included um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word for um, a facade treatment. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I just went, just drew a blank on it. Sorry. Um, this includes stamped concrete, but not EFIS and not stucco. Sorry, I couldn't find the word EFIS. So what Act 8 is proposing to do is introduce some modern standards by adding the option to use metal panels and fiber cement panels for buildings that are located in the town center and in destination centers. This is the slide that we presented at the public hearing to town council. And um, I thought it was kind of an attractive looking bank, but it caused some concerns <laughs> with the council members because it's an awful lot of wood on that one facade of the building. And the conversation came up about, well, what would you do to prevent something from being you know, almost 100% wood in town center, say somebody came in, you know, with a restaurant that wanted to have a real rustic feel. So um, we looked at addressing that, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Um, the next thing we're looking at is the composition element of the community appearance manual. Instead of looking for precise building symmetry in each segment of a building, what's proposed is that you look at the overall building and you look for balance with the overall building facade so that you can achieve a high aesthetic value without having to have a building that has perfectly symmetrical segments. So this is an example of how you could, you know, look at this overall building and see that there may be some asymmetrical elements, but you've still got a nice degree of balance when you take a look at it on the overall uh, facade. We're looking at an amendment to the quasi-judicial requirements. Most development plans comply with the LDO and they can be approved administratively. And then when you've got certain plans that come in and they exceed a certain square footage, over 100,000 square feet, or they exceed a certain density threshold, over 100 dwelling units, then a quasi-judicial public hearing is required before the planning it, before the Zoning Board of Adjustment. It used to be before the Town Council, but a recent LDO amendment changed that. Then there's some large-scale projects that are appropriate for a development agreement. So Act 8 is proposing to remove the requirement to have a quasi-judicial public hearing before the Zoning Board of Adjustment and have a more streamlined process if the project has already been vetted by the Town Council and has been subjected to a development agreement. So this would still be carefully vetted and reviewed, but it wouldn't have to go through that extra step. So when this was presented to town council on October 24th at a public hearing, um, there were no speakers. And as I mentioned, there were council concerns about the potential for an all wood facade. So what we wanted to make sure of is that we didn't get something that looked like this in town center, a commercial building, maybe, you know, a farm to table restaurant or something like that. Now this by itself wouldn't meet our community appearance manuals because there's not enough windows and there's not truly a base and body and cap on it. But there was a concern that a lot of wood would really not be in keeping with the carry look with the high percentage of masonry that we have. So what we've done now is we've proposed to reduce the amount of the metal or the fiber cement panels. It can't exceed more than 40% of the facade treatment. So that's the only change that's been introduced since this was presented to town council. So it just puts a little bit of a, a cap or a break on that. And the, um, the masonry requirement would still be there, you know, but then you could use this material you know, to meet that at, as long as it didn't exceed 40% of the building. So this concludes staff's presentation. Uh, these again are the four items for, for your consideration and I'm available for your questions. Thank you, Ms. Grannon. I'll now turn it over for board questions. I have a question about item B, the height measurement. Mm -hmm. So I understand and agree with the intent of only measuring up to the roof baseline. Um, if an applicant were to be consider wanted to consider adding a parapet or one of those other items, would that be part of the application? Would would we know on a case by case basis that they wanted to include something like that so that 
there yes, we would see it. The elevations would be required okay. as part of the development plan. Okay. And then does it still give town the authority to approve or deny based on the height of that parapet or whatever it is that they're putting on top of the roof? I'm sorry. I'm not following your question. Somebody wants to put up a 12-foot parapet. I see. Thank you. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that wouldn't Thank that you. would not Whole count. Exactly. <laughs> that would right, right. We would still just measure to the top of the roof line. So that is correct. Okay. I think there might be cases um, where there's a large piece of equipment that does need a very high parapet wall to screen, and I think part of the this proposed amendment is to allow designers to do that to have a unified parapet element that functions as an equipment screen and isn't a separate element and so it would create a more unified appearance to the building so it could be 12 feet tall there are some very large pieces of rooftop equipment. and what it would be yeah. much more attractive than what you see with some of the yeah. rooftop screening you know with the yeah. louvered panels that you yeah. see on top of some roofs to be able to extend that you know attractive yeah. And in some cases, what has the appearance of masonry on the exterior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to make sure that there's there's still the ability to approve or deny um, their usage of it. Uh, well, they it, we would look at whether or not it's meeting the masonry requirements. And I really, I'm not an architect, so I don't know whether or not it's feasible to think that you'd be getting some extremely tall parapet, but... Um, I, I can't imagine that that would really be in keeping with the look of the building. They still have to have their base, their body, and their cap as part of the CAM, the Community Appearance Manual. So, you know, we're going to be looking at some balance with that, too, in aesthetics. Okay, good. And, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. I guess, um, we're doing a so on item C, I'm sitting here laughing inside because I'm looking at what we're proposing on item C and I'm looking at the town of Cary, the pendulum swinging from what we used to mandate, dictate almost all design considerations to now opening up the pallet. I, I think it's great. But um, but what what is Raleigh going to kid us about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll think about no, it. You know? No beige buildings. Right? No more beige buildings right. and we allowed a Bojangles. Um, I'm assuming because we went through there was a lot and seriously there in a serious note we went through a lot of LDO removing a lot of LDOs around appearance due to changes of the General Assembly so I'm assuming that these all that, fit within that, that. that applied to residential oh that was residential yeah. didn't apply right. to commercial okay right. thank you because as we start getting mm -hmm. into that okay um, that was really just my question on that, and, and so it's about the percentage. So you couldn't have an, the all wood building. I think wood is a lot of design elements, but they're, they're just limiting that nobody could come in and um, if they want to do all wood. And I guess I kind of go back to I can now I, I really understand the parapet thing because I, I see some of the developments have come in. This last one was one of them, um, where if you had a chiller boiler on one of those eight-story buildings and you wanted to screen it then it really becomes an issue yeah. as we're seeing more and more of that but it is i guess i'm trying to f ask staff about where do you ever can and so there has to be continuous so it's got to be the same material they just can't put some vinyl screening around it it's got to be visually but it is that you know it, i guess the question is i you know is the staff going to have enough leeway to ask is the parapet purposeful you know whether it be for outdoor living space or for large you know it's no we're not we're not going yeah, to regulate okay. that i mean this is going to um pre present an opportunity for that but it's okay. not going to guarantee that that's going to happen right. um it may just you know be just to screen the hvac equipment it may be a design you know on the part of the architect that submits the plan that it looks good yep. um but but it doesn't it doesn't equate that yes definitely we're going to get outdoor living space but it just opens the door for that opportunity and and i support that i guess the one point and we don't have to maybe we don't have to deal with it but as we see building height becoming an issue in a number of zoning cases, or rezoning cases coming before us and balloon tests, et cetera, mm -hmm. and we say the building's limited to X amount, and then 
we, you know, they, we allow a 10 foot parapet on top of that for screening purposes for all the good reasons. You know, you all, the staff will get the phone calls or the elected or the council will about, I thought you said that building is only going to be 60 feet tall and, you know, I, I looked at it, my estimate is, you know, it's 70 feet. And you just have to explain that, that's mm -hmm. all. Yeah, and I think, I think it's um, with what we've seen with the quality of design that's been presented to us from different architects that have come in, we're not scared about something like this because if you want a successful building, you're going to want it to look good and be attractive. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the the exterior, the parapet itself is going to have to meet those material standards and the design standards in the LDO. So, I'm, I suppose I'm still puzzling over the same question that you asked. If somebody comes in with a horrible proposal for a parapet that's ridiculous, do we have the legal authority to say no? That that won't work. Um, it's well, ugly and it's too tall. No way that anybody wants to approve it. Do we have the legal authority to say no? We would um, probably have to sit down and talk with them about the design. I don't think we would. Um, yeah, I'm going to turn since it's a legal question. I'm going to turn to our expert. Well, Deborah did a great job the first time because I think she's right. It's going to have to meet the community appearance manual. Um, so the architectural things that we look at to make sure it's not completely out of proportion and it does match what the rest of the building looks like. Um, and that is incorporated into our LDO and it is something that we can enforce. Okay. And that's what I wanted to know, that it, that it was an enforcement mechanism there. Any additional questions? All right. I'll look for a motion. Can I make the motion? Go for it. Okay, I'd like to move that the board find Act 8 Land Development Ordinance and Community Appearance Manual amendments consistent with the comprehensive plan and other applicable plans for the reasons set forth in the staff report, presentation, and discussion by the Planning and Zoning Board. Do we have a second? I I'll second. second. <laughs> Um, I would just like to say the reason I wanted to make the motion is I think um, these are great amendments, great changes that allow um, first to maintain the beautiful character of carry, but then allow for more creativity. And I think the use of additional materials is really terrific, and I'm very happy to support this. Thank you, Deborah. That was sure you officially got the second there, but if, <laughs> now that you have anything to add, you can comment for. I have no comments. <laughs> I really enjoy, I really like some of these pictures because that's more my taste, and I'm happy to see that the town is expanding its vision of what is uh, appropriate and um, attractive in terms of future development. So I, I hope that gives you the latitude to be able to allow a lot more creativity, as Jessica had mentioned. Any other discussion? Would all those in favor please say aye? Aye. aye. Opposed? That one carries unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Granin. Uh, we're going to move into our new and old business, and we do have an item of, of new business. Our 2020 tentative meeting schedule. Uh, hopefully, all the members have had an opportunity to look at it and think it over. Um, does anyone have any concern? We're not going to have an actual motion, uh, since council is the ones who does approve that. But does anyone have any feedback, comments uh, that they would like to uh, I guess post the staff prior to presenting this to town council. December 2020. The date. I think is it the 21st? Is that did I read that the, the, correctly? Yes. That that would be my only recommendation. That I'm not sure Christmas week is a week awesome before. time to have a a meeting. I don't know how <laughs> others feel, but you know that would be something that maybe we could consider moving. Would you suggest moving it to the 14th? Yes, sir. Tuesday the 14th, so would that work? Tuesday? I mean, Monday. 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 So it'd be moving, moving it up. Monday. So the, the meetings are typically the third Monday, so sometimes yeah. they deviate. They're the second Monday if, if there's a, con if there's I, a conflict. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I believe it's typically the fourth Monday. Oh, fourth Monday. Fourth Monday. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think staff had already moved that up a week uh, for us to accommodate for Christmas. Um, oh, good. Okay. But we can definitely... Um, ask them that, assuming nobody else <laughs> has the room. Um, we can definitely ask for that change to be to be made. Um, does anyone else have any other? 
I have one, one question is um, we and somebody correct me, staff or somebody correct me if I'm wrong. It was that if you missed two meetings as a board member, you needed then reapply even if you were midterm, if that's correct. And at one time, and I'm wondering, you know, at one time I thought that applied with planning and zoning when we had both work sessions and regular sessions. It was two total. And so now with work sessions being somewhat intermittent. I missed the last work session because by the time I got scheduled, my work schedule is out sometimes several weeks. And so I work around what's published, you know, particularly on the Monday night. So I, I don't want to, because there's one meeting I know I'm going to miss and I don't. And it's bother. actually three. It's actually, if there's it's three, three absences. Three absences. Mm -hmm. And are, are we, as the Planning and Zoning Board, are we counting also work sessions mm -hmm. in that three? Okay. so. Our work sessions, even though they're intermittent, and we, we will only give you as much notice as possible with those. Uh, so, it, yeah, I think if yeah. you do have conflicts in advance, let us know, and we'll, you know, we'll do whatever we can. We tried with the last work session, as you saw, we tried to make a really concerted effort to look at your schedules and and mm -hmm. you know make sure that it was mm -hmm. convenient. So. so let me ask. I mean, on a serious note, so on the work. I miss the scheduled work session, but I appreciate, you know, Katie and Scott have, letting me have a makeup work session. So, and whoever's keeping the, the attendance, <laughs> <laughs> Scott's going to be the thumbs up back there. You know, I did, I did come in, I turned in my homework. Uh, <laughs> well, I have a question about so, that. Is the, is the, <clears throat> you're not allowed to miss three meetings or, or your, I guess your commitment to the board comes into question if you miss three meetings. Is that, um, what, what is the, it doesn't Reason. it doesn't automatically mean that you're no longer on the board it just means that the um, council liaison needs to evaluate okay. and and be aware of it and just make sure there's sometimes there's really legitimate reasons somebody might be in labor <laughs> that would be a good reason to miss a meeting well. you know sometimes it just can't be helped yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, you know and then they have to meet again with the council member to talk about reappointment and okay. if it's very problematic then then we would talk to you further about it and that's not a uh, calendar year either right it's an appointment year or uh, that, I'm um, that it's a three-year term it's a so board October. year correct board thanks year. jillian oh, October. Yeah. Okay. i ask because i know um, mm -hmm. i won't be here for the july the 27th and my daughter's getting married later that week and so I'll be in Idaho. You can come to Idaho if you want. <laughs> um, well, okay. One thing I do want to add to that is if anyone does have concerns about meeting that threshold, um, especially since he's not here, uh, please reach out to Don France um, and, and kind of let him know what's going on in advance. Um, since he obviously is our council liaison, um, he'd be the one to, to kind of work with. So um, if you do foresee that of being an issue, um, definitely reach out to him in advance and kind of work. Um, I'm sure you know something can be worked out or, you know, extenuating circumstances and whatnot. But as soon as you know, um, probably better to, to reach out to him. So, mm -hmm. okay. um, For the schedule, um, does anyone else have any feedback or comments or questions? Um, well, in that case, uh, that would be the last item on our agenda. So we'll be uh, looking for a motion to adjourn. I'll, I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> she makes a motion. I'll second, the, I'll second her motion. All, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We're adjourned. Cary TV. Visit the Town of Cary's website at townofcary.org.